Good afternoon, good, good evening. I'm Brad Scheller. I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees of Lehigh. Um, it is my special honor to welcome you to what will be a most informative, compelling, and thought-provoking event. Um, I think that uh, it's wonderful when Lehigh turns out with interest and enthusiasm and commitment um, to hear uh, great speakers like we're going to hear this evening. I also want to welcome and thank our distinguished guests, Ken Langone, Stanley Druckenmiller, Jeffrey Canada, and Stephanie Rule for taking the time both to focus with us on issues of national import um, and issues that are particularly relevant to all of you who are students of this generation. I also want to um, thank and recognize the presence of two student organizations sponsoring this event, Scott Van Stein, Scott, thank you, Scott, uh, of the College Republicans and Max uh, Perricone, hi, Max, of the College Democrats. Thanks also to the class of 2017, another student organization sponsor. Um, for all of us, it is wonderful to see this kind of student enthusiasm, and we so appreciate it. Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Stephanie Rule. Stephanie is Lehigh class of 1997. Um, she is anchor of, for Bloomberg Television, uh, and she hosts the program Market Makers. Um, she is extraordinarily enthusiastic, committed to uh, the subject at hand, um, and her energy is both contagious and remarkable. Uh, Stephanie, we want to thank you especially for making this evening happen. Uh, it's wonderful, terrific, and it's great to have you back. Thank Sister. you for having me. Before, before we start, if there is anyone in the hallway that isn't in yet, or if you have any friends that got turned away and went home, text them and send them back. There's four seats right here, and there's room in the aisle, and they can sit here. And the reason you should stand is you've stood through more. I've been to tailgates here, and it's cold and muddy and disgusting, and that didn't <laughs> bother you. This is a conversation you need to be a part of because it's about your future. And the fact that these three men that I'm going to introduce you to aren't just here at Lehigh, but they are passionate Americans who are touring the country on a mission, on an initiative that's going to affect you, not them, that none of them can benefit from. I think you should all think about that tonight, tomorrow, and going forward, what this message is and how it's going to affect you. So I want to first introduce you to Ken Langone, who I said, Ken, how do you like to be described? And he likes to be just clearly passionate. When you look at this man, you think passion. But a passionate American, <laughs> an entrepreneur, sadly a Patriot League member, an alumni from Bucknell University. Sorry. We'll go to beach Saturday, too. Good luck with that. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, Co-founder of Home Depot, Jeff Canada the leading mind in educational reform. Stan always says the true celebrity is Jeff. And I grew up in finance, and I said, sure, sure. And when I called Lehigh and I told them who I was bringing, immediately they said, Jeff Canada? And I said, yes. Um, so Jeff joins us with a very different perspective because he represents some of the most extraordinary children in New York City who need your voices, who need you to reach out and create change in our country. And of course, Stan Druckenmiller, who's leading the charge. If you don't know Stan and you're in the business school here, you should leave and write your parents an apology letter because he's one of the greatest investors of all time. Stan has spent an insane amount of time researching what we're about to talk about here, generational theft and the need for entitlement reform. And I want, who wants to start it off? Stan, with your extraordinary slides. Yes. Okay. Why don't you set the stage about, for us? Stan Druckenmiller. Wow, this is some turnout. I'm, I'm figuring a third of you are required. <laughs> a third came to see Jeff, and a third that came to see Stephanie, and Ken and I were along for the ride. You think, Ken? <laughs> Nothing left for us. <laughs> Look, I know what you're thinking. I do. Um, you're thinking, why on earth is a once successful retired money manager who's knocking on the door of senior citizenship, bashing old people, and declaring a war on entitlements? Well, the answer is, I'm not. Um, I am approaching the age of 65 very rapidly, um, and let me say regrettably, but I am definitely not here um, 
to tell you boomers should go bust. In fact, I am here to tell you that entitlements, in my opinion, have been one of the great successes of American government in the last 50 years. If you look at the chart above you, you'll see the poverty rate for senior citizens since 1960. And basically what you see is we've gone from about a 30% rate to 9% rate for seniors at the poverty level since 1960. This is a great achievement. I think all Americans should applaud it. And frankly, the reason I'm here is I think an achievement like that ought to be perpetuated and around and successful for the next 50 years and for your generation and the generation after you. And if, in fact, we go with current policies and we don't reform them, that's, going to hap them. that's not going to happen. And frankly, we don't have a whole lot of time. Now, Stephanie mentioned my former job, which was an investor. And in the investment business, my job was to anticipate change and to look at the future. Somewhat embarrassingly, um, I, mo I made most of my big money looking at unsustainable situations and capitalizing on busts. Um, I didn't do quite as well in bull markets, so I was basically an underperformer. I don't think a shrink would think that was uh, a very good comment on my personality, but um, we'll live with it. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that we're doomed. I'm not here to tell you that we're all going to be broke and this problem isn't fixable. It is fixable. But if we're going to fix it uh, for the next generation, for your generation, for the generation after you, to keep that red line down where it is, we don't have, to, we don't have the much time. We have to move sooner rather than later. Stephanie mentioned that I like my slides. Um, the red line is poverty level for seniors. The blue line is poverty level for children. It's pretty interesting. If you look back over this time period, while the poverty level for seniors was dropping from 30 to 9, the poverty level for children actually went from 20 to 23 percent. Can there's you not leave that slide? Well, just can you please say that one more time? Because I think that's so important. Okay, I'll say it one more time because Steph. <laughs> don't you? Jeff has given me My time. wife's don't at you? home. I, <laughs> don't you? My real boss, my wife's at home. I guess Stephanie is here filling in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you who know who Fiona is, it's definitely true. Um, so the blue line is the, is the poverty rate for children, the red line is the poverty rate for um, senior citizens. And you can see they've been going in different directions. And in fact, Stephanie, I should probably mention that poverty rate for children at 23.5%, out of the top 35 countries in the world, that puts us with the 34th highest child poverty rate. Um, we beat Bulgaria, all right? The other 34 are ahead of us, including Latvia, uh, Greece, you name it. We have the highest child poverty rate in the United States. Now, it's interesting, the one thing you've heard politicians say throughout this whole political fight, and you've heard it from both parties, is we're not, going to we're not going to balance the budget on the back of our seniors. And let me just say, they certainly haven't been balancing the budget on their back of the seniors for the last 40 years. Because what I'm going to show you today is, is a number of charts, and, and here's basically what's been going on. The economic pie for the last 40 years, a greater and greater share of that has gone to seniors. Less of that has gone to children, and less of it has gone into government investments, things like Head Start, things like NIH grants, stuff like that. That has been squeezed out. Now, let's just look at what we've got up here. In red is the per capita spending by age group, and it's basically a percent of income per worker. Now, it's pretty fascinating. If we were here in 1960, uh, some of us were alive then, not me. Okay. <laughs> and a lot of you weren't. The average aware American worker, if they made a dollar, 15 cents of the dollar they made that they earned would go to support our elderly, and about two cents would go to support our children. Now look at what's happened over the last 40 years. That 15 cents that the worker was taking out of their dollar of income, now 57 cents 
goes to the elderly. So, so over this time period, the elderly have gone from 15 cents of a, of a worker's income to 56 cents. Children, on the other hand, have gone from 1 cents to 8.7 cents. I said I'm not going to bash old people. I'm not. I am going to bash their lobbying groups that have made this possible. I'm sure you all saw the speech by the AFL-CIO head yesterday who was critical of President Obama and who was saying, if there is any adjustment whatsoever to Social Security and Medicare, they are going to go after Democrats. This is the head of the AFL-CIO who is a, is a very important Democrat, as we all know. So the elderly have been increasing their share of the economic pie vis-a-vis -vis the government for about 40 or 50 years. How have they done over the last 20 or 30 years in terms of net worth? Well, if you're 75, you're worth about 150% more than a 75-year-old was in 1983. But as you can see, all the older grade age groups have, ma have made some significant progress. However, if you're 29 to 37, and I'm sure some of you in this room are, or if you're around the age of 20, you haven't done so well. In fact, if you're 30 years old and an average American, your net worth is worth less today than it was in 1983. That's not all the transfers I've talked about, okay? There's things like the stock market, other things that have happened, but it's important to know that one sector of the age of our society has done incredibly well the last 30 or 40 years, and another has done incredibly poorly, particularly when you have the political system set up. If you look at the sequester, what happened? Who was spared, all right? Entitlements. It's the one thing that wasn't touched. What did they touch? Food stamps, Head Start, NIH grants, right across the board, the stuff that affects the children Jeff is working with. So, so far, I've basically shown you a snapshot of where we are in terms of relative wealth gains, relative share of the pie the last 40 years. But let's look ahead 10 years and see, well, is this about to correct itself? So, and a lot of this has to do with the sequester. So let's look at if the spending on children in the last 40 years was this versus the elderly, what's going to happen in the next 10 years? If you look in the administration's budget, over the next 10 years, Medicare, excuse me, over the next 10 years, all government spending is projected to grow a trillion dollars. So a trillion dollars. Of the trillion dollars, 875 billion of the increase will go to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. How much will go to children? Anybody want to guess? Got a trillion dollars here, 875 to Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. How much to kids? Six billion. Six billion. That's what they get. And that's after the snapshot I've already showed you. That's, where, that's what we're looking at going forward. And one of the reasons is um, the dotted black line, which I'm about to extend for you. So far, this has all been about the elderly increasing their share of the pie relative to the next generation. Now, something more interesting is about to happen. The black line is the share of the elderly of the overall population. And you can see over 15 years, um, they went from about, oh, this chart's hard for me to read, but I know in my head, they went from about 13 10% to 13% over 50 years. Now, here's the current problem. Because we had this thing called the baby boom, where people came back after World War II and started making a whole bunch of babies, and fertility rates were very high during that period, you're about to experience a very unbelievable demographic phenomena in the next 20 years. And essentially what's going to happen is those people that have been given a lot more share of the pie, there are going to be a lot more of them eating, eating the pie. Specifically, the elderly are going to grow about 8,000 per day for a while, and that will peak in, in 2029 at 11,000 per day. And you can see as a percentage of the population, they're going to go from 13 to 20. That's over 20 years after having only moved 3% in, in uh, 50 years. So 
here's what happens. And let me put it in layman's terms. This is, this is the best way to visualize this. So right now, we have 8,000 new seniors created every day. And we have people working to support the payments for those seniors because we have these weird, with this weird system, it's not pay as you go, where your income will support seniors, their income supported their parents here as seniors. So it's not pay as you go. So you need new workers to support the entitlements that we're paying out. But the next, where we are right now, you're creating 8,000 new seniors per day. How many young workers do you think we're creating per day to support them? Anybody? 2,000. So you're creating 8,000 seniors per day, but young workers, 15 to 34, we're creating about 2,000 today. And that gives you what you're looking at in the dependency ratio. Here's the problem. They've been getting a much bigger share of the pie for many years, okay? Now there are about to be a whole lot of them, and then the people that are making the pie, they're about to shrink dramatically relative to the seniors, and therefore you get the dependency ratio. Right now we have about 4.8 workers supporting every senior. That number by 2030 is going to drop to 2.8. For those of you who need visualizations between now and 2030, here's what America is going to look like. Today versus 2030. In 2030, the age of the average American is going to be more than the age of the average Floridian today. All those people walking around in strollers, they're going to be, they're going to be replaced with people around in walkers. That's what you're going to be looking at. And it's that population that's going to be supported by a much smaller, um, not smaller, but relatively smaller working population. So you see, basically, the thing that creates this as the 18 to 64 year olds increase 100% over time, but they only, the workers only create, increase 17%. Now, I mentioned I have the dubious reputation of having made a lot of money in financial busts. Um, one of the things you look for in terms of, uh, of unsustainability and looking for a terrible situation is off balance sheet liabilities. My favorite one was Enron. There have been a bunch of them, banks, the shadow banking system with subprime debt. But you really can't have a huge bust unless you're hiding something from investors and from the public. So I saw in your student newspaper today, there was an advertisement that the national debt is $16.8 and growing. Um, and it's pretty wild. Every week, some Republican is running around talking about how the debt is 16.8 trillion and having a heart attack over it. I have some very bad news for you. If we did our government accounting the way any corporation in America did, well, that's not true, Enron, okay? Uh, but any corporation that's not a fraud, that debt would not be 16.8 trillion, it would be 200 trillion. And let me explain to you why. The way finance works, let's suppose I owe Jeff money. God forbid. He does. <laughs> but he can afford to pay. We're going to so, settle up right after this. I, 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 owe, I owe Jeff money, and I have promised to pay him back after he's 65 with a, with a stream of income. Under any corporate system in America, I would have a debt. I would have a debt to Jeff, unless you're the U.S. government, because my payroll taxes have been going to the government for quite some time, and when I'm 65, I'm going to start getting entitlement payments. That is nowhere on the government's books. And as you can see, there are going to be a whole lot of us that are going to be coming on the government books over the next 20 or 30 years. If you moved, if you called that a debt, those payments that are owed to me by the federal government promised to me that $17 trillion, you moved it onto the balance sheet and you present valued it at a 3% discount rate for all the business students, the $17 trillion goes to $200 trillion. So this is what we're facing. We're facing a pie that we've allotted to our elderly. We've cut out investments. We've cut out spending on children. And now there are going to be a whole lot less pie makers supporting pie eaters. So we're looking at a situation that is absolutely not sustainable and has to be fixed. Um, I have a lot more slides. Stephanie hates them. Uh, 
We've had question and answers go on and on and on at every, every university we went to. I know the people from Lehigh aren't going aren't to disappoint. I'm going to sit down and shut up because maybe we can get into some solutions and uh, have a good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff Stan was talking about cutting Head Start. It would be great if you could give the audience a snapshot of what things really look like <coughs> for our young people, what it really is like for kids living below the poverty line and how they're being affected by all this. Well, well you know, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, thank you. That, a little late, but that was good. Uh, I, I, I try and judge these schools. You know, Stan and I went to Bowdoin. They were nice to us. Uh, we know if we go to Bucknell, they're going to, but this is Stephanie. She told me you all were terrific, that y'all liked me. Then y'all gave me that tepid response. I don't know. So, but I, I have to tell you, I am so impressed. I, I, this is a great turn. I'm just. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I was like, don't y'all have anything to do? Sorry. So that's another issue. So, so. They it's came Bethlehem. What else they are they going to see, do? They came <laughs> to see Stephanie. I know. Right. So this is, don't take this wrong, but Stan and Kenny are here on one mission, uh, and, but I am not here because I'm worried about you all, right? You all are in a pretty exclusive class in America, right? Really smart and talented young people. Not gonna be easy for you, you're not gonna, life is not gonna just sort of say, hear it, but you've got a real shot at the American dream. And I think what you have here are three, two of my closest friends who all are different examples of the American dream. How is it you start from nothing and make something out of your life? So I am less worried about this group, but I am terrified about the kids that belong to the Harlem Children's Zone in places like that uh, all over this country. Uh, these young people uh, have to have a government that's going to be fair. There is no way that we as I think a group of uh, responsible Americans can leave a debt on these kids that's going to destroy their opportunity to actually make it. Uh, this is not a theoretical thing for me. Uh, we've got places where uh, kids are struggling uh, and what Stan and Kenny and I, we we're all on the same board at the Harlem Children's Zone, what we have said to our kids was you play by the rules Right? You work hard, you avoid crime, you avoid drugs, you don't get pregnant, and go to college, and then you're going to have a, a great life. Right? This is, and then I've been looking at this information, those slides. Let me tell you something about when I, I first saw this. Uh, I'm a, like a disaster movie kind of guy. Right? I kind of like, you know, you get something horrible is going to happen. And I just, well, the first time Stan showed me slides that predicted disaster, I just quite honestly didn't believe it because it was so horrible. It was right before the tech crashed. And I was like, Stan, you can't be the only one in America that knows this. And he was showing me slides that compelling and when it was going to happen. And it, so that happened and I said, the guy got lucky, right? It's okay. He's made a lot of money. So he got lucky on that. Then he showed me another set of slides not too long ago that predicted the crash of housing. Now this time, when, when I looked at this, I said, this is going to destroy America. And we had to do something about this. And so Stan and I, we didn't go public like we're going now. We both considered ourselves insiders. We went to Washington and we showed that this thing was going to be a disaster to the month. And no one did anything. So here I am, I'm not in finance, I'm not in business, uh, but I know the economy is going to crater and this whole thing is going to come apart. As a guy who's running a program in Harlem and people who should be protecting America, they're not doing it. And what year is this? Give us the year, the year before it crashed. May of 2005. Yeah. So now that happens, I watched, no one did anything. So then Stan says, Jeff, remember the last time I, I've got something I want you to see? And I'm thinking, not again, right? Here we go again with the slides, right? She, she hates the slides. You see why? And I'm looking at this now. I'm, I'm a Democrat, right? So this is, this is now kind of heresy, right? I'm a Democrat. And I'm saying we can't do this to our kids. 
this is not right. Now look, um, you'll, you'll hear from Ken, Stan, maybe they need their social security, maybe not, uh, probably not. Uh, I'm not so sure about me. I'm not sort of saying, you know, I'm gonna be able to live off, off social security. This is not something that we're saying is something we're saying that Americans can't have social security, you can't have Medicaid, you can't have Medicare. What we're saying is you have to do it in a way that is fair, that doesn't mean my kids are gonna end up having to pay more than they actually uh, uh, get uh, back, that they're gonna finance us and it's gonna be a deficit for them to pay for my generation. Uh, that to me is basically un-American. Uh, I think that for poor children in this country that the only hope is going to be the jobs that get created by things that NIH does, the uh, food that they have to, to use from, from uh, uh, food stamps. If you just looked at, there was a big article in the Times today about the gap in the words that kids know. Well, one of the best ways we've had to try and close that gap in the early ages is Head Start. Why would we punish these kids? So I'm listening to all these politicians, Republicans and Democrats, why would we punish those kids while not even having the guts to take on and say, this should be done fairly? Not eliminated, not destroyed, but just done fairly so we don't have to hurt the most disadvantaged. So on this, I'm kind of like a crazy man uh, because I just think this is un-American. I just don't think this is the deal we have in this country where some people take from others. Everybody is against welfare. Well, this is a different kind of welfare to me where we are allowing older folk to hurt younger people. The last thing I'm gonna say on this, Stephanie is right, that slide drives me crazy. When you look at what's happened to poverty and children in this country, that's what I've dedicated my life to trying to erase, right? And uh, we have spent a lot of Stan and Kenny's money trying to erase that, and I would love to say that we have, but you saw that chart. This is not something, now how is it that we could do such a great job with those seniors? And what is it about seniors that allowed us to come up with a strategy that children don't have? Seniors well, vote. That is it. That's what allows it. Seniors that is vote. it, and everybody's afraid of them, so no one is gonna tell the truth about this. And everybody's gonna say, well, you cut them. No, you cut them. No, you cut them, because if you cut them, they do vote, and they're gonna be upset. We, Stan and I and Kenny believe that even seniors don't want to hurt their grandkids. They don't want to, but no one's talking about this. Uh, and so part of the issue is uh, this is basic unfairness. Uh, and I think that uh, as a community, we have to do something about it. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't think going the political route, which didn't work the last time, is the way that we're going to change this. Can, can, can I just repeat that? I, I forgot he was talking. I've never talked right after him without applause interrupting. Um, can, I, can I just repeat that I am not against seniors, but we got to realize everybody in this room is going to be a senior. And I want these programs that has poverty rate for elderly at 9% maintained and preserved. And what I showed you with that $200 trillion is not going to be around. So me, it's not about old and young. It's about future seniors and present seniors sharing in this sacrifice appropriately. So this thing about we're against seniors and entitlements, I think this is a great achievement. I love entitlements, but I love them so much that I want them for you when you guys are 65 too, not just me. All right, Ken, you just spent the last two days in Washington. Mm -hmm. You're one of my favorite seniors. When you have these conversations. And you know I'm a senior. <laughs> <laughs> I, do I take that as an insult? <laughs> <laughs> when you have these conversations in Washington with political leaders, what do they say? I was at a lunch today with Sam Nunn. Sam Nunn is truly one of the better elected officials we had in the last 50 years in America, and he's right down the middle. He's a Democrat nominally, but he's right down the middle. And he made it very clear today, the simplest, the most significant challenge this country's got going forward is entitlements. Let me, let me set the stage a little bit. First of all, let me assure each and every one of you in this room, my belief, America's best days are ahead of it. I wish I was your age. I really, I really mean that. I wish I was your age 
because I know you're all frightened about the people that can't get jobs, but trust me, the opportunities and the opportunity to do good in this country have never been better. You're the smartest generation. You've got all this technology to help you. I remember when I was where you are, I had to go to a library. I can sit now in my home with a laptop on my lap, and all of the knowledge of the world comes right to my lap. So this is all the things you have going for you. Well, let's understand a couple of things. Social Security, in my opinion, and entitlements have been perverted. That's the only way I can put it. My mother and father, my father went to the eighth grade, my mother went to the seventh grade, and I can tell you, the check they got from the government every month was important to them, not only for sustainability, but also for self-respect. But can you imagine me, as well as I've done, getting a check every month, my wife and I, for close to $3,500. That is absolutely outrageous. Now let me tell you why you're the key to the kingdom. I disagree, these people do vote. These people last year were as much a determinant of the outcome of an election. Well, why don't you ask them how many people in the room voted? Well, how, uh, the, the question is how many voted, which way did they vote? The point is, the thing we have... <laughs> Right? I mean, I'm a Republican. Like yeah. Don't rub it in, all right? I mean, they whipped us bad, all right? But let me, let me say one thing to you. I'm practical. God bless Stan. God bless Jeff. Jeff's in the, tr in the trenches every day with these kids that are struggling. They're struggling. And Stan, God bless him, his genius, not only his genius, his generosity is allowing Harlem Children's Zone to do what it does. But let me tell you something that's critical to this country. We need to fix this problem, and we can fix it. If our elected officials, who by the way, would, not many of them would get medals for bravery because that doesn't carry you through life in politics. If you're brave, you typically lose the next election. But we need to get you people off your butts and out there in the streets these people are in the room, they're off their butts. We're talking about their generation. I'm talking about the whole generation. I'm talking about all of Believe me, a 3,000 mile journey starts with the first step. A forest fire starts with a match that big. You need to understand that it will not be fixed until you or future generations like you put these politicians in a position of risk. Right now, the only risk they have are the old geezers that show up through these different organizations whose names I won't mention, but none of which I belong to because I am diametrically opposed to what they do. They never have enough. They never have enough. You people need to let them understand there is a downside to pandering to people like me. And that downside is their political life. This will be fixed. It'll be fixed sooner rather than later if you make your voice heard. But this cannot continue. I, 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 you know, I live in a, and by the way, this is not Democrat or Republican. Uh -uh. I live in a gated community in Florida in the winter, one of my many homes. Can you imagine? I got all these homes and I have all these other stuff and I get a check every month for the U.S. government for 30, my wife and I for 3,500 bucks. Something's wrong. So I go, here's this community, about 98% Republican. And if you walk into that card room and suggest for a minute that their social security is going to be tested for means, they go nuts. They go out of their minds. Then, then why do you think? Well, but let me, let me, let me make, I ask them, <laughs> I ask them a question. I say to them, how many of you have fire insurance. They all raise their hand. The best thing in the world that can happen if you have fire insurance is never to put a claim in for your fire insurance policy. And by the way, if you don't, the government or the insurance company does not give you your premium back. The logic of I paid it in and I'm only getting my money back is nonsense. You are the key to solving this problem. But it won't get solved 
If you don't do what you're good at doing, you spoke about same-sex marriage last year. God, God bless you. You spoke about the environment again and again and again. God bless you. Look at what you did. You, your generation, 40 years ago did with the Vietnam War. You can go on and on and on, but you got to get off your butts and you got to get active and you got to let these elected officials know, hey, I'm a voter too. And if you don't take into account what's right for me, Prayfully, all of you will do as well as the three of us. Well, the two of us has done. <laughs> <laughs> They're working on me. But I'm going to get in Social Security. That's what I want. All I know is every time he comes in, I know it's going to cost me money. <laughs> Thank God. But, but seriously, many of you are going to be as successful as we are. You're not going to need it. But God forbid if you were my parents and you needed it, it won't be there. It won't be. It's not sustainable. Please, you got to, if you love this country, and by the way, there's no country on this earth like this country. It is the greatest nation on earth, and trust me, we will do better and we will be better. But it won't happen. Please, you got to get going. You got to start now. And if you don't, it'll happen eventually, but it might happen at a point in time when it's too late for you. That's my pitch. All right, well, okay. in this. Woo. And then I ask you, Ken, while he was going on, said that brave people don't win elections. So for a room full of young people, when they hear something like that, that brave people don't win elections, what should they look to do? At what point in history did brave people stop winning elections? Well, I don't know whether brave people stopped winning elections, but Jeff and I were the generation where Lyndon Johnson was executing the, the uh, Vietnam War. He won 49 states in 64, and the young people went up against him, and he didn't even run in 68. Uh, we drove him out of office. I liked, I liked what Ken said. I, I don't know whether it's, it's a question of brave or not. They respond to public pressure, and I have no doubt that the young vote is, is, is the reason we got gay marriage. They can, they can move the needle. To me, it's just a question of of putting this on your priority list. And it, it, it's a big priority. And again, Jeff, uh, Jeff said something very important. I, I honestly believe if the seniors knew the numbers we've shown you, and I'm going to show you some more later, I think 90% 90, 90 of them would be four. Um, but do you really believe that? Because Ken just I, said a I, moment ago when he walks into the card room at his club in Florida. He's got Republican. some weird friends and they're Republicans, okay? Um, See, look, look, I tried to be he, fair yes. and they're throwing it back. Yes. I, I, ha, I, I, ha, I, I don't believe those people in the card room are aware of these numbers. I have seen grandparents and great parents and parents around their children and they would not tolerate um, putting the next generation behind the eight ball uh, for, for the kind of entitlements they're getting, because we're talking about something much bigger than but entitlements. But Stan, here. is it going to change how they vote when they go into that booth and pull the curtain, and it's just them? And the question is, do I get to keep the money, or does somebody else get the money? Because well, people say really nice things at cocktail parties. It, it it doesn't matter if their vote changes. We have 70 million young voters, all right, and these young voters elected a dynamic president, okay? But right now. He doesn't feel the need, and more importantly, his party doesn't feel, because when I read the paper, he looks like he's starting to move on this issue. They don't feel the need to address those young people because they've already got them. Well, then they've I, got I, them. I think, I think this is a funny situation because I think both Stan and Kenny are right on this. If you say to someone, should I keep money from the government that I've earned, mm -hmm. that this is, I worked hard for this, and that was the deal, I get to keep the money, they say yes. I'm not going to give that money back. I earned that money. Nobody, so that group, I understand why they would just be like, no, and taking something from someone once you have given it to them is very hard. And one of the things Stan suggested was that we do this a long time ago before our generation got to this age and people didn't listen. But there's also this issue that I think what, what the fundamental principles are of who that money belongs to and how it, people don't honestly understand that. And I think that that's what's so important 
because it does suggest this is not fair. And I think the average American believes in fairness. It just is harder to convince them something's not fair if it's coming out of their pocket. And I think that that's a challenge. So I don't think the seniors are going to move the needle on this. I really don't, Stephanie. I think you can, you can maybe get them to not be crazy about it, but I think this is going to be a, a war and it's going to be fought by young people to uh, sort of make this a more equitable system. You know, I, I, I love to get grandfathers. And sir, I don't mean to offend you, but because you have white hair, are you a grandfather? Okay, I'm not either, and I'm 78, all right, so, all right. Is there a grandfather in the room? You're right here, okay. You and your grandchild are marooned on an island, and you've got one meal left. Do you eat it, or do you give it to your grandchild? There isn't one grandparent I've ever asked that question to. This is that simple. This is that simple. Let, let, let me tell you what I think is going on and, and how you can have this dichotomy. And God knows, if for those of you seen <laughs> Waiting for Superman, my friend Mr. Canna has been struggling with the teachers unions for quite some time. If you haven't seen it, you must see it. But, but if you meet much, most teachers, they're wonderful people. Yes, they are. And they're dedicated they and they really want to make a difference. But they've hired somebody to, to lead their union, and it is that union's leader's job to get what he can for those teachers. That's his job. Right. Get them the shortest day right. and get them the most pay. And who is he negotiating with? Oh, he's negotiating with politicians who, that's his boss. And the politicians, he's the one funding them. So again, there's a perfectly rational person who's leading the teachers' union, going and hitting up somebody who he's their biggest contributor to, uh, to get money for. Of course he's going to get it. But I truly believe 85 to 90 percent of the teachers, they're not even into that. They just got somebody doing it. And it's the same thing to me with the AARP. It's the same thing. I think if most grandparents focused and knew these numbers and knew what was at stake here, all right, they wouldn't be so enthusiastic. Do you know I'm 60 years old? you know when I started getting stuff from the AARP? Yep. When I was 50. Yep. I've been getting something every month telling me about the day that's coming in 15 yep. years when I'm going to get all these benefits. Yep. I mean, these guys are really organized. But I don't and they know. tell you exactly how much you're going to get. <laughs> and it is, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> they tell you exactly how much you're going to get. They say, right now, when you turn 62, you'll get this. When you turn 65, you say, so this is implanted in the minds of folks. In the first the, of your birthday, I don't know, they couldn't do the health exchanges. They should have got the AARP. When you turn 50, there will be a letter from them in the mailbox. But I think part of the answer, Stephanie, is, sh is shine a light on the problem. And there's, something, there's a bill being pushed through right now by 700 really great economists, bipartisan. I think there's at least 20 nobles called the Inform Act. And all they want to do, all right, is put those liabilities on the balance sheet. Because even the most rabid Republicans are running around, by the way, I'm independent, I got nothing against Republicans or Democrats, they're running around talking about 17 trillion. God, I wish it was 17 trillion you guys were facing. It's not 17 trillion unless you think all those Social Security payments and all of Medicare is going to go to zero. That's crazy. But I think you shine a light on it as part of the deal. When we started this session this afternoon, there was an introduction of a, a leader for the Democrats and a leader for the Republicans. I do. I like people better when they come in my office and tell me there's a problem, but they offer a solution. So let me be the person coming to your office. <clears throat> you two leaders, you get together, and you energize your members not along philosophical lines or party lines, but on what's right line. There's an opportunity here for you people to say, this is something we can agree on. There is nothing partisan in what we're talking about tonight. He's an independent. He's a Democrat, although I'm working on him, and I'm a Republican, <laughs> OK? There's nothing political here, nothing political at all. It's, it's really making our nation better and stronger yeah. 
for all of us and take the low-hanging fruit, means test guys like me and say, forget it, you're not getting any more. And you want to complain, complain, but it's over. And then do some modest changes. Increase the retirement. At 55 or above, you're grandfathered. I don't agree with that at all. Well, go ahead, but tell them why. Hmm? Tell them why you don't agree. Why should a 55-year-old be exempt? I just showed you the 55-year-old's been getting more potential pie for 40 years, and now you want the next generation uh -huh. to pay. Nothing drives Stan, I, I, want you no, to I talk agree with you, Stanley. Your point's made, but... I'm trying to be <laughs> I'm hold it. I'm it's trying a lot easier. to be the deal maker here. I am <laughs> trying to be practical and okay. get okay. the least amount of resistance I'm going to get. And Simpson and Bowles laid it out. I don't think you should be exempted. I agree with you, Stanley, but if I got to compromise a little bit to get the thing done, I'll do it. We got to be practical politically. But I, I don't like that. Okay, well, uh, all right. <laughs> all right, Stan, I want you to talk a little bit about, obviously, we spent 16 days in a government shutdown. We all talk about breaching the debt ceiling. We haven't resolved it. All we've done is push it off for a little while, and it's coming back. What does that mean to 20-year-olds who are in the room? You know, last week, the day before the resolution, the market went up almost 300 points. So what happened to Wall Street? It just got richer. But what does all of this mean? As Wall Street is thrilled to have Janet Yellen as the next Fed chair, which means monetary policy, the monetary machine is going to keep on pumping. Can you speak about the fact that the reason we are going to continue to have stimulus and we're not tapering, if you look under the hood, it's because the country is so broken. And these are the kids that are going to have to pick up the pieces. So what is the question? I want you to <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the debt ceiling issue, the shutdown, and what it means for everyone here? Because for you, you had a great week last week, I'd guess. I did have a very good week. There he goes. I did have a very good week. Yeah. Um, look, the whole debt ceiling thing is a farce. Uh, we're talking about debt. We're talking about this. We're talking about that. But again, I go back to the sequester. What happened? All right? We cut discretionary spending. We cut Head Start, we cut NIH grants, we cut all this stuff. By the way, there's no money there. You couldn't solve, forget what you think about Head Start versus Social Security or Medicare. There's no money there, Stephanie. So to me, this whole thing is a farce. And all we've done is basically nothing. And if you look at sequester, I want to go back to the number I cited early. They're going to get their $875 billion, and the children, are going to get cut, and it's only going to grow by $6 billion over the next 10 years. In terms of the economy, one of the things I hate about what's going on with monetary policy is I think the politicians feel the Fed has their back. I remember investing in the German Deutschmark back in 1992 when they were unifying with West, West and East Germany were unifying. And the head of the Bundesbank told those guys, if you don't do the right thing, I'm going to jack interest rates up to 10%. There is no way you're going to destroy my currency. And you know what? The politicians did the right thing. You know what Ben Bernanke told these guys in September? Oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to adjust monetary policy because we might have a government shutdown. Well, if I'm a politician, I go, Yahoo, the stock market's going to be up. We never get action out of politicians unless there's a financial crisis. It never happens. So to me, the, fa the Fed is aiding and abetting misbehavior in Washington by canceling the market signals. I don't know when the bond market would get this. Frankly, there's reasons I could tell you that are too much for this room. It might not be for 10 or 15 years. But I'd at least like to see what the market thinks about it. How the hell are we going to know what the market thinks about it when the Fed buys 80% of the debt? And with regard to me, you're right. What is going on? The money goes where? It's trickle-down monetary policy. Let's get the billionaires some more profits. I did, I did have a good week. And maybe I'll go out and buy a new Tesla or a Bentley or something, and maybe they're going to hire somebody. Well, guess what? In 2012, um, the top 1%, our income went up 19%, and the median income in America went down. This is the greatest transfer of wealth I have ever seen in my career 
from middle class and poor to rich. This crazy monetary policy where we're printing all this money and billionaires are getting rich. Ken, you want to weigh in? He's like, I just got a new Jeep. Oh, you I did. did. My birthday, my 78th birthday. I know. Let, let me, we desperately need to address this problem. And Stan makes these points. The other point, Stan, I think that you mentioned about how we're going to get 300,000 more out. And the kids that aren't even born yet are going to pay 400,000 more in than they're going to get out. That's assuming over infinity we close right. the fiscal gap. Right. It costs them 427. Right. This is outrageous. What, what do you, pardon me, let me be blunt. What do you need to do to get pissed off? What do I have to say? I, I mean, right now, you ought, your, your blood ought to be boiling. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it has nothing to do with it. The fa he, he's right. Bernanke's keeping the game going. And, and we need to fix it. But we won't fix it unless there's a political force that holds these politicians accountable. You know the first and foremost thing in a politician's life? Getting elected. Getting reelected. That's all. Number one. Then how are you ever going to look to a politician to make a long-term decision when he or she has a four-year time horizon? Uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I've come to realize, Stephanie, is that there are movements that happen in this country that aren't predictable and that change things quicker than any of the prognosticators can predict. You look at what happened at the White House in gay marriage. That was on nobody's radar screen. And like that, it changed the whole country right. immediately. And that was something that was building, that they actually had tried to suppress. Right? They didn't want to come out with that then. It was a plan. It wasn't this. But this thing came out and changed dramatically. So I, I think you can get dramatic change yes. if people begin to set the, I think, framework uh, and the foundation for that change to happen. The big issue, we think, and, and the only reason we're here, is that we think that young people have to understand this. And if there are three things they're going to vote on, this has to be one of the three. I don't care what the other two are. It can be any other. But if we can get that done, we do believe, because Kenny said there's only one thing they care about, getting reelected. And if this has to come on their agenda to get reelected, then this will come on their agenda. If it doesn't, you guys are basically had it, right? I mean, that's essentially where this thing is at. And the question is how to get it on their agenda. And the reason we can't do it through our generation is that by the time this becomes, when I go talk to the Democrats, and Kenny talks to the Republicans, we're, we're, not, we're not getting anywhere on this thing at all because there is not the outside pressure saying do the right thing. The outside pressure meaning the people in this room. That's I right. want to thank but, you. If, but hold on. Right now, today, these kids have a better chance of engaging political leaders than generations before them Absolutely. because of social media. So if students, you can reach out to politicians immediately their teams are checking their Twitter feeds constantly. You don't have to write letters. You don't have to knock on their door. But would you say, even what you do in education reform, when you see how much outreach you can get using social media, isn't it extraordinary? Well, I think yeah. this, is, this is something. So Stan mentions the head of the AFL-CIO uh -huh. essentially saying to a Democratic president, I've sniffed out that you want to do a deal on entitlements, and we're going to say, and you do it at your own peril, and the rest of you all, if you do anything, we're coming to get you, right? That's basically the message. Mm -hmm. Now, this has happened with no body, so the president is there thinking, uh, who's going to support me with this? So right now, he's under attack in his own party then for trying to do Then millions of young something. people that's can tweet what, to him and that's say, what I've got to your be back. Happening. Absolutely. Suddenly, if that happened, suddenly the president would say, hey, I'm not out here on a limb by myself. It's just not me against the unions, right? There are other people in America who actually understand why this is important. Right now, I will guarantee you this is an inside game. It is just the unions putting pressure and no one else going to the Democratic president, because the Republicans can't, to say, do the right thing. But if an entire college campus tonight Telling tweeted you. at the president of the United States, I assure you, tomorrow morning, it wouldn't be an inside game. It would not be an inside game. You're 100% correct. And by the way, be practical. It cost you nothing. 
The wonderful thing about this technology today is you can communicate with millions of people. No postage stamps, no phone bill. I mean, it's incredible. You've got, you got the weapons. You're smart. You're the best educated generation of your time in the history of this country. And the president can't ignore you. Politicians can't ignore you. They've put themselves in the middle of social media. When, thousands, when hundreds, thousands, millions of you tweet at them, they can't ignore it because the media will pick it up. So, and Stephanie, the, you're great, but why don't we ask some students some questions and answers? Well, because yeah. at 6.15 we're supposed to, but we can start now. Let's start now. Let's start now. So, so, <laughs> but before you all feel sorry for Stephanie, because you've got Ken and Stan, just think I have to work with these guys all the time, right? And in a small room, they're just as powerful and loud. So, uh, right. Stan always asks questions, <laughs> and he's never looking for an answer. He's always already decided it. <laughs> all right, so why don't we start with questions? Make them tough. Yeah, just here raise your right hand. Here we go, right here with the blue shirt. First you have of all, a question, say your, raise your, hand say your name. Uh, my name is Alex Mark Antonio. I'm a senior at Lehigh. Um, I know I read your article on Wall Street Journal about uh, your opinions, uh, Mr. Drunkenmiller, and I, I know you talked about means testing a little bit and uh, potentially cutting a corporate tax. Are there any parts of the fiscal budget that you think are also fundamentally flawed? Well, look, there, there's a lot of waste in the government, and I'm sure there's a lot of flaws, but to me, the money, the money is in entitlements. And they, they have milked or demilked that bone so dry in terms of cutting back on discretionary spending. No, I just don't think that's the way to go. I do think fundamental tax reform, I think, would, would go a long way for this. And by the way, I don't want to do fundamental tax reform in 10 or 15 years. I want to do it now. And there's several, there's several reasons for that. This first chart is a pure economic chart. It has nothing to do with fairness. And it basically shows that to fix the fiscal gap today, the $205 trillion, you could raise everybody's taxes 55%. If you wait um, 20 years, you've got to raise the taxes 71%. You could also cut spending 36%, or if you wait 20 or 30 years, it's 44%. Why is that important? Because the problem that's getting bigger because the interest debt is just compiling away. But I have another reason I don't want, I want to, if we're going to raise taxes, I want to do it now. Alan Blinder, who is a great economist, got about 50 IQ points on me, says, for example, Social Security is fixable. All we got to do is raise taxes from 12 to 15 percent. So why are we talking about this? Well, that's why I am talking about it. If it wasn't fixable, I wouldn't be here. So if we can fix it by raising taxes from 12 to 15 percent, why don't we do it now so the 55-year-old that Ken wants to protect, okay, pays a little of his share going forward? Because you know what happens if we wait 15 or 20 years? We're going to be over the 65 year. We're not going to be paying. You guys are going to pay it all. So we can all pay 15 now and pay a lot before you come on the payrolls or the young people come on the payrolls, or we can just put it off till 2033 when things bankrupt, and you will pay 16 and we'll have paid 12. It's crazy. Now, I took some real heat um, in the blogs, although Jeff has taught me I'm not allowed to read <laughs> blogs anymore because he's been attacked for many years over suggesting corporate tax rates go to zero. But I don't really understand what these people are looking at because corporations is not some amoeba blob out there. Corporations are owned by shareholders. For God's sake, I argued to double the, the rate that shareholders pay on their gains. My favorite blog was, he must have an angle. Hey, I run a family office. I don't have any income anymore. My only income is capital gains and dividends and I'm arguing for this. Why? Because a, it's a generational issue. 60-year-olds are worth five times what 30-year-olds are. So once again, if you tax ordinary income higher than you tax capital gains and dividends, it's a wealth transfer from the young to the old. More importantly, if you look at economic decision makers, if the guy that is actually hiring people 
and he's going to build a plant, his taxes are zero, I think he's going to be pretty incented versus a coupon clipper who's just trading away or collecting dividends. I really can't see them having an effect on corporate decision making. So that's one thing I do in terms of tax reform is, is literally double the rates on capital gains and dividends, but take corporate taxes to zero. By the way, there's corporations already paying zero. If you want to know how corporate welfare and crony capitalism works, it works through the, tra through, the, through the tax code. You send a bunch of lobbyists down to Washington, you get a tax benefit for this. So that's, that's a couple suggestions I'd start with. You know, there's another problem with our progress in science. It's not going to be uncommon for people to live to be 100 years old in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. Thanks to the Langone Medical Center. Hopefully, <laughs> among others. But seriously, think of the stress on a system. You know, when you mess around with nature, there are unintended consequences. I'm not suggesting we should die young. But I'm saying to you, the longer we extend life, the more costly it is to maintain that life. And all the things that Stanley is saying doesn't necessarily take into account their longevity. But you look at people in their 80s and 90s, they, they have a high maintenance need, whether it's a walker or a, a special way to build a house so they can shower or whatever. These costs will be all on your shoulder unless you're willing to pick up the baton and say, enough, enough. Now you've got to listen to me, and I'm urging you to do that. I'm here to tell you I'm ripping you off. I take your money every month, and I give it to my charity. I feel good about it, but I'd feel better about it if it was my money instead of yours. You've got to do something about it. Next question. Uh, do you think there's a fundamental problem uh, between the two-party system, especially considering that it's, it seems that hundreds of issues are determined arbitrarily which uh, party is in favor of, you know, whatever, uh, like many issues? Yeah, well, look, I, I think, you know, our political system uh, has become one that uh, has, uh, in many cases, been so gerrymandered that people don't have the interest of the whole uh, as their own political interest. So when I can just represent my little community and I've made sure that only people that agree with me live in that community, you get very partisan kinds of results. Uh, and uh, I think that when government stops operating and something is as broken as this is, you've got a real problem. So I don't think it's a permanent problem. I think this could be fixed, but it won't be fixed unless folks start demanding that government actually work. And right now, uh, I think when Stan's talking about, and Kenny's talking about what happened when the market, when the whole government shuts down, and the market is like, who cares, right? That means that's us saying who cares. We don't care if this thing works or not. And I think that's a major problem. Uh, I think that everyone should feel heat when the interest of the country is not coming first. And I think that we've got a, we've got a real issue right now. And some of the partisan, uh, I think, bickering uh, has gotten in the way. But I think this is more fundamental than that. I think that, you know, you can be on one side or the other. There were folks who were for and against immigration. That's going, they're going to fight that out. Uh, this is, to me, is a separate entity than all of that, because this is a problem that has real consequences right now for, for the whole entire generation that is not our generation. And it just continues. So this one, I think, is in a different category than some of the other political bickering in Washington. And I feel equally that the Republicans and the Democrats are unprepared to solve this issue. That in the end, they want to blame one another, and they will not get together and even do the basic minor things necessary to fix this. And it could be fixed fairly painlessly if we do it now. It'll be some pain. It will. But fairly painlessly for the country. The longer this thing waits, the more painful it will be or unless they bankrupt the whole nation. Upside down. Uh, upside down. You got it upside down. The figures. Ken taught me that. <laughs> I strongly disagree with Stanley's position on taxes, uh, raising the capital gain and the income tax. And the reason is pretty simple. I think everybody in this room 
whether you're employed or a student, has a deep suspicion of the government's ability to spend anything effectively. And much better than increasing taxes, where the money go, all goes to the government, and then they screw it up, spending on this, that, and the other. Why not institute a philanthropy tax, where you pay a certain amount to the government to cover the military and other essential needs that can only be covered by the government, and then you enforce a, a means test, if need be, on the income generated from capital gains and dividends and force it to be spent philanthropically. It would be a hell of a pain in the ass administratively, but the best money spent in this company, country, is spent for philanthropic purposes, and the government does a lousy job in spending most of the money it raises. Buck, there's only one problem. It's not practical. Why is it practical? Because, Buck, you're going to deal with a system that's only going to become more complicated. I, I under, what Stanley's suggesting to me is more politically palatable. Why? Because, first of all, think of all the money that's in all these, these warrens all over the world so it doesn't have to be brought back here because they don't want to pay taxes on it. That all goes away. That all goes away. It comes home. The pie, the pie gets bigger. If, Buck, if you cut corporate tax rates to zero, no more building plants in Ireland, no more building crazy precisely. stuff in Puerto Rico, no, the economy would boom, okay? And the shareholders should be taxed on that. I'm not, I don't even know whether taxes would go up or down. I'll guarantee you one thing, tax revenues would go up because the economy would grow. But I'm, I'm talking about corporate tax rates at zero. I'm just saying shift it from the operator to the coupon clipper, which by the way, what a coincidence, happens to be the very wealthy and the elderly in this country. What a surprise. Good evening. I'm not a Lehigh student, although I love Lehigh University. Um, I work for a nonprofit organization. So I guess my question to you is, um, it's frustrating because um, we're understaffed, it's challenging, um, budget cuts, all those wonderful things. Do you have any suggestions on what we, as community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, can do to get this message out and to empower the people we serve? That's a, that's a great question. And let me tell you, that is the reason that I first became suspicious, uh, which was every time there was a financial crisis, it seemed like the poorest and the most destitute communities were the ones that were taking it on the chin. And I said, how, how is it that this keeps happening when that, and Stan talks about how small that discretionary spending is. Uh, relative to the budget, and yet that's the one place the Democrats and the Republicans can agree, let's cut that, right? And it's all the services that support the most disadvantaged communities, and that to me is what started getting me crazy. I didn't quite know why it was happening, because I had never seen these numbers. I just didn't know the growth in these other areas, and I will only, t so the, 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 see, what can you do? I think, again, here's another example that an organization that rallies its parents and others to be aware of this, and when someone has a solution, whether they're Republicans, whether they're Democrats, whether they're the president or a senator that you say, yes, we want you to continue that discussion because we need to get this situation resolved. I will tell you this, I know what's gonna to happen to our services if we don't deal with this issue of entitlements. Uh, because we are all in discretionary. All of our work is in discretionary, and it is tiny to begin with, and they're going to just slaughter it. So I think this is, I just think that our parents have to know, our staff have to know, people have to know, this is not Republican, this is not Democrat, it's not whether you like Obama or dislike Obama. This is about let's do this in a fair and equitable way so we don't have to fight over the crumbs, which are already not enough to sustain most of these communities. Did you have a question right, right here? here.
What do you think makes um, our country and the people in it so greedy to the point where a little bit of taxes or even more taxes comes out of their check, but they don't want to do that for the better of their community and their younger people? That's not America. That's human nature. Okay? I wish, I wish it was American because we could then figure out how to deal with it. But human nature, what it is, we all know we need garbage dumps. We just don't want it next door to our house. Same thing here. What, what Stan is demonstrating clearly and irrefutably is that this needs to be fixed, and it can be fixed. The irony of it is, my belief, and Stan's the economist and superb, the irony of it is you will unleash dramatic economic growth in this country if you do this. So there'll be more jobs, there'll be more investment opportunities, there'll be more capital gains. One thing I heard these last two days in Washington, everybody says no matter what you do in Washington, if you don't get economic growth going, you can't fix the problem. Just can't fix it. So, so ma'am, with all due respect, I don't think it's, it's a rich versus poor. I think it's human nature seeing, don't take it from me. Yeah, <coughs> my thing is like what you said about like the dumps. Why can't everybody take a little bit of trash rather than one, a certain <coughs> group have to live next to the big dump? Well, think about the answer. Would, you wouldn't have a solution. You'd have a bunch of little garbage dumps all over. Or you know, nuclear power, same thing. Nobody wants a nuclear power, whatever it is. I, I, would, I would say that the, what you're talking about is how power gets exercised and who, what happens to the powerless, right? And I think that in the end, one of the reasons that the work we're doing in the community of Harlem was Harlem was that dumping ground. It was that place that nobody wanted to be. Uh, it was a place that told the whole community, go anywhere but here. This is not a place you can raise your family. And part of what we decided was we could change Harlem. We could actually make it a place that people wanted to come to and people wanted to live. And it wasn't going to become the dumping ground for crime and drugs and all of that sort of stuff. The challenge, I think, is that that's an exercise of power. Uh, and uh, I would love to say that someone will say, please bring it, bring it to my neighborhood and bring it in my backyard. I just, none of us say that, right? And so the powerless are the ones that end up, uh, I think, having uh, a disproportionate share of that, which is why we believe in education, because we think it's the only way you can equalize that. And you've got to get people voting, and you've got to get people active, and they've got to know there's a solution. So I just think that power struggle will always be there. And the question is, in your community, they cannot be the powerless. You've got to help your community, because it's going to be a fight. And it will always be a fight, but there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it should be a fair fight, in my opinion. And right now, I don't think it's a fair fight. I, I, I'm a, I'm a low-tax guy, guilty as charged. I mean, I don't pay low taxes. I'm not in Buffett's category. I've always paid over 30. But let me tell you, and th this is selfish because maybe I'm playing God, but when I look at what's going on in Washington, whether I want my incremental dollar to go to Pelosi and Boehner, or whether I want it to go to Jeff Canada, or stem cell research, or I don't know you, but, but this not-for-profit, I just, you know, it's part of what Washington does with people's money, I think, that upsets them. If I thought they were spending my money even with 5% of the efficiency the way Mr. Canada spends my money, I'd be all for it. Now, maybe that's selfish, and I know people say, who the hell are you to be able to play God and, and distribute money to stem cell or Harlem Children's Zone? But it is, it is tough for me to send money to Washington and see what they do with it. Hello, uh, David Cabert, freshman here at Lehigh. You said one of the main problems, one of the main drivers of this problem is lobbying by senior groups. How would you reform lobbying, or for that matter, campaign finance? Jeff, you well, want to Well, look, I'll, I'll start because, uh, you know, I think that uh, money in politics has become a huge issue in this country, uh, and I'm, I just think it's gotten uh, out of hand. Uh, and the Supreme Court decision on this, you know, said it was fine, and I don't think that's doing our country any service, but I will tell you this. The last election proved it. Money will not win you an election over ideas and people who understand 
what's actually gone. Because there were a lot of people who spent a lot of money and got nothing for that money, thinking you could buy the presidency or any other position in this country. So it's not quite as simple as that. But in general, do I think that there's a problem with money in politics? My answer is yes, I do. Uh, is there a way to be fair about this? People talk about this group having money, but people don't talk about that group. So they'll talk about the Koch brothers, but they won't talk about the unions, right? And so when you look at it, it's all money in politics. And you've got to say, if you're against it, you're against it across the board. It's all too much. That being said, do I think, I mean, it's a Supreme Court decision. Do I think anybody's going to walk that back? No, I don't. So I think that a uh, part of this is, this is the system we have right now. We've got to figure out uh, how to make it work. The Kenny said something, though, that I think the Obama administration uh, sort of shocked folk. You can do a lot with very little because of technology, right? You can be in contact with millions of people all the time because of technology if you get up. So that, to me, is the only neutral, that, that neutralizes to some degree the power and influence that money has. That's a new phenomenon. It did not exist before. Let me, let me, I think the number is roughly half eligible voters vote. Only half the people that can vote, vote. I think that's the number. If we can get all of you, all of you not in this room, but all of you people all over America in the same classrooms in the, in the students, if we can get two million votes, you will change the course of history. Don't forget, look at what the, what the spread was in between the winner and the loser last year. I'm telling you, this is a solvable problem, but it's going to take some sweat, and it's going to take a lot of passion and a lot of doors slammed in your face. But if you're willing to do that, you'll get it done. And trust me, when you have 500,000 kids show up on the mall in Washington, you will get their attention. Organize this to say, we're going down there. Generational theft is over. The shell game you're playing with us is going to end. They see a half a million people. Remember, God bless them, remember Martin Luther King. Thank God we've taken this country a long distance. It came a long distance a lot faster because of Dr. King and what he said and what he did. This is, to me, from the standpoint of all of you, this is critical to your futures and your children. And your children haven't been born yet, their futures. But you can make it happen. Well, on that note, I think the two people we should bring up are Max and Scott, the two who lead the Republican and Democrat clubs here at Lehigh to wrap up the evening. But I just Good. wanted to thank so much Ken, Jeff, Stan, for your time, for your passion, for your dedication. Before we wrap this up, let's just give another round of applause for having such a great job. <laughs> great job. Great job. I hope you're all able to take something good away from this event today because this is something we all are going to have to face. All, all of us today at Lehigh, we're all going to have to face this one point in our life. So I hope you're all able to get some good information out of this event. And if you want to get more active on campus, uh, the College Republicans meets every Thursday at 7, and also the College Democrats. They meet on Thursdays at 7 as well and drown. If you want to get involved, you can always email me or anyone else in the club. So. Can I ask you? the question, how do you personally feel about what we're talking about? I, I personally agree with you. Stand by the microphone, we can't yeah. hear you. I personally agree with you more and Stan here, um, and Jeff. I mean, I agree with all of you pretty much. <laughs> um, I, I, okay. You are I, a politician. <laughs> before I came to this event, I already knew it was a big issue we all had to deal with. And I mean, when I, I'm surprised more people aren't concerned about it. I mean, it's, it's a bit, when, I, when I went to vote, I voted mainly on trying to fix our economic issue. And I mean, I'm, I'm surprised more people aren't concerned about it, to be honest. 
I mean, <clears throat> I agree as well, mostly with Stan. I think that we would all care a lot more if we were actually aware of it, but unfortunately we're not. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this room right now didn't know anything about this issue until they came to this event today. So. Is that true? How many raise your hands that didn't know, have any awareness of this? Please raise them high. We're, we've heard this throughout the country. Yep. Well, are you going to do something about it now? I hope it's a silent yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.